Big Dumb Movie is a comedic podcast that often contains obscene language and outlandish commentary. Listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to Big Dumb Movie, where we discuss video games of the nostalgic variety. I'm your host, Corey, and I'm joined today with Jonathan. Hey guys, great to be back. Review Dude Josh. Pew pew. Stevie. What's happening? And Brother Josh. If you piss me off, I'll throw a chair off a deck. <laughs> What's that about? <laughs> it's a teaser for later, man. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh, this is going to get good. Sounds like some Indiana shit. <laughs> We're doing something a little different today. This podcast is going experimental, queen style. We are here to discuss video games, specifically video games that we have nostalgic feels for that we grew up on. To me, video games begin with NES. Now, I know there was such a thing as video games before the Nintendo Entertainment System, but I was born in 1986, and Super Mario is like the first video game in my mind. In my head canon, <sighs> fuck off, Pong. Brother Josh, can you tell us about Super Mario Brothers? It is my first memory of a video game, and I remember my dad coming out of like a Kmart, and he had the NES. And I was just like so befuddled. I was like, my family can't afford that. Why does he have that in his hands right now? <laughs> but my first memory of the game itself, or my first really good memory is probably a week later, my dad waking me up for me in the middle of the night is probably like 945. And he's like, look, I'm on the last level. So I got to stay up extra late in a preschool night to watch my dad beat Bowser at the very end. Pretty wholesome. <laughs> Wait, your dad got it for himself? Uh, it was for me, but... <laughs> no, don't worry, Josh, it's common. Believe me, I got those stories too. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. <laughs> my dad's a pretty young dad. I think when I was in preschool, he was in his mid-20s, so it was a joint yeah. system for sure. Yeah, my dad was definitely more of a gamer than I was. Did you have a Nintendo Entertainment System? Oh, for sure. And I remember being so bummed as a kid because our house got broken into when we were like, I don't know, uh, I think I was like eight years old or something. And so one of the things they stole was my dad's entire NES oh, collection. He probably oh. had like 50 games, you know, and Super Mario 3 for sure was the number one. Anyway, so we got another one like secondhand later on. And then we got into like a few other games. They had like Paperboy, you know, <laughs> yeah. fucking asshole dog would come out and knock you over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Paperboy was a shitty game. There were a lot of shitty games on oh, yeah. the NES. And Paperboy was one of those like very repetitive games. Yeah. I remember playing it specifically at a dentist. <laughs> one time when I was a kid, I got to go to one of those fancy dentists that are aimed specifically for children. And they have video game consoles, and they had an NES, and they had Paperboy, and I was like, this is amazing, I get to play this while I wait, and I played it and I put that shit down. I was like, I'm done playing this, it sucks that fucking bad. Yeah, that game just got, like, it never got harder, it just got so fast that it was hard. Like, it never increased difficulty. It was repetitive, yeah, it was yeah. like, not fun. It's one of those everything tries to kill you NES games, which there was like a lot of, I feel like. Yeah. Like, the more structured games like Mario, I think, had like the better gameplay. Paperboy was a game that prepared you for life, though, Corey. If you really <laughs> dug into it ever, it's going to train you in persistence and perseverance and like some real things there. You mean with everything trying to kill you? Or just delivering paper? It, yeah, and making money yes. and losing clients. Uh, yeah, it's just very realistic in some ways. I guess you can draw like far-fetched analogies from any video game <laughs> if you want to, hey. Josh. But <laughs> I, I don't want to go past Super Mario too much. We have a lot of games we're going to discuss, and it's going to be a fun roundtable kind of experience. But review to Josh, did you play Super Mario 3 when you were a kid? Oh, hell yes. A theme you'll start to pick up on is my dad, he wanted to be different. So my cousins got Nintendo, we got Sega. They got PlayStation later on, we got Xbox. My dad just wanted to be different from my cousins. 
So my memories from the NES and the SNES are basically playing over at my cousin's house. I think Super Mario 3 was like a really fun game to play like with one other person. Like we're going to team up and we're going to try to beat this fucking thing. Yeah, it was definitely a pass the controller kind of game, right? I mean, you could play two players, but you had to alternate, you know, like one at a time. One was Mario, then after you beat a level, you had to switch to Luigi. Um, Super Mario 3 was like expansive, though. Like this game went on and it had different worlds and different character sprites as you progressed. It was pretty cool. My question for you, Corey, because I played the crap out of this game, too. This is actually best friend Drew Rockland's favorite game of all time. But what part of this game sets your endorphins going off the most? Because I feel like Mario 3 has a lot of those like little victory and just like really satisfying moments. Makes your balls grow a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> ah, man. I think... The thing that gets me excited when I played Super Mario 3 was like the little bonus levels. It was like a game within a game, you know? Not only did you have like your regular levels, which you can actually select and you could choose which route you want to go on some stage, which is already cool, but every now and then you'll get like a little bonus stage pop up and you get like a little prize that you can use later. Yes. It was just a cool system that I didn't really see in other games at that time. And not to mention, marketed in the greatest movie of all time, The Wizard, right, Josh? Whoa, son. Now, just where do you think you're going, boy? California. 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 Yeah, this game was marketed in the Fred Savage vehicle, <laughs> The Wizard. <laughs> and I, I think we're going to kind of breeze past Super Mario 2, which I think is fair, Corey. But I want to give a shout out to, like... This kind of like blends SNES and NES, but it's a Super Mario All-Stars. And just Mario 3 in general had this like little battle mode you could play. Mario versus Luigi. And you're looking at each other. And it's either first to five coins or the first person to get like hit by something and die. Do you guys remember that? Oh, yeah. No. That is actually the first <laughs> Mario game. Mario Bros. The arcade oh. game. They put that into Super Mario 3. And uh, it was kind of like a bonus thing. But that was its own game. Actually, it was an actual arcade cabinet. I remember the local Chuck E. Cheese, when they used to have actual arcade games back way back in the day, yeah. they had that cabinet, and I loved it. If you got an uh, afternoon to have a couple beers and like chill with a friend and like kick back on the couch, battle each other in that, it's so incredibly fun. Definitely. There's a game that I don't know of anyone that's actually played it that I've played called Time Lord. Now, Time Lord, it's one of those NES games that's marketed like it's super fucking cool. The cover art on this is amazing. It's this badass dude in a suit of armor with a sword. There's a dragon behind him. A spaceship is flying by. Like, this shit looks fucking badass. The music, when you turn this game on, fucking rocks. In fact, I probably have some of the music playing right now. And I'm probably going to use some other music from this game for the intro. When you play this game, you're just like this little fucking shitty character sprite that looks nothing like the cover. It's so awkward to play and it's stupid. You just got to collect these orbs. There's like tons of useless enemies just coming at you and you hit them and they just fly off the screen. This game is fucking bullshit. There was a lot of NES games like that that were like meant to sell to little dumbass kids that had no idea what the gameplay was actually like, just based on the cover. Oh, I'm looking at the cover right now. He looks like a real guy McHero. <laughs> <laughs> Generic hero man? Well, yes. considering Milton Bradley came out with this game, they had no fucking business in the video game industry. <laughs> Stick to Monopoly. Stick to Guess Who, bitch. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Review, dude. I played a lot of Double Dragon, which also had some pretty fucking sweet cover art. Was that one that you were into? Oh, hell yes. Me and my older brother used to double team a lot of games, pun intended, and Double Dragon was one of them. But oh my god, I remember us just 
staying up super late one night and playing the fuck out of Double Dragon. I played Double Dragon as well, and I had this problem with the game on Mission 3. Do you remember Mission 3, the forest level, Josh? Oh, I wanted to play some of these games in preparation for this <laughs> plot, but nah, <laughs> I, okay. I don't remember off the top of my head. That's the level where you fight two Abobos. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> so when you get to the point when you fight two Abobos... Two Abobos? Two fucking Abobos. <laughs> two Hobos? <laughs> <laughs> we could go down the street fight two hobos right now. I'm not about that life anymore. <laughs> two Hoboken, New Jersey's? A Bobo was like a, like the big buff character sprite in the game. He had like a bald head and he was shirtless and he was like massive compared to your player. He was huge. Yeah. And he was the first boss. And then later he had to fight two of them at the same time. And they don't just appear on screen. They break through a fucking wall. And then they like they like to double team you. They go on both sides of you. Yeah, I, I'm like picturing Chong Li from uh, from Bloodsport. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it's Chong Li with a shaved head. I'm telling you. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> with those massive chesticles. Yes. <laughs> that dude has done some push-ups. Just a couple. But you're supposed to beat them, and then you're supposed to go into the cave that they broke out of. Like, they break through a wall, you're supposed to go into the wall. I didn't know that as a kid, so I just kept going right. You know, left to right, side-scroller game. The fucking stage repeats if you go right. So it just oh, keeps no. looping. And I would just oh, keep no. playing this level until I die. <laughs> and I was idiot. like... I was like, how the fuck do you beat this? This is, this is some kind of living hell? <laughs> I was in the fucking Double Dragon Purgatory. Oh, it was like Groundhog Day. <laughs> yeah. Now, I do want to talk about Super Nintendo as well here next, but real quick. Jonathan, there was a wrestling game that I believe you played on NES a lot, right? Yeah, this was a really, really awful, shitty wrestling game, but it was the only one I had. My dad took me to this video game and record store at the time called Salzer's. Shout out to Jim Salzer's over here in Ventura. Hell yeah. Um, they're still up. They actually just closed their video and video game store. I heard about that. Broke yeah. my fucking heart, dude. Yeah. Yep. But uh, anyways, I remember going as a kid over there with my dad. We would buy some used games and stuff. And, you know, that way they weren't too expensive if they were a shitty game. And I don't think he mind spending, you know, two, three dollars on a game. But um, that game was awful. It was so bad. The controllers were just horrible. The the wrestling moves were awful. But I loved it. That's another game with ridiculous cover art. Yeah. I know. I looked it up and uh, yeah, it's like two ultimate warrior types like grappling with each other, but they're like animated in a a silly two D fashion. Yeah. Totally. Real quick, I just wanted to give a little shout out to everybody that uh, knew to blow in the cartridge, stick it in and out of the machine, up, down, up, down, up, down, Seriously. up, down a few times, and twist the, the AV jacks in the back like a few <laughs> times in order to get your Nintendo to work and somehow it worked. Like nobody, there was no like online suggestions and tips for this. Like somehow every kid that ever had a Nintendo just knew how to do these tricks to make their Nintendo work. I remember sitting in a circle with like seven or eight kids and like one or two of them are kind of in charge of cleaning it out and blowing it. And it, like sometimes it'll go on the screen just like flash red, black, red. And everyone's like, oh, blow again. <laughs> up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Put it in and it starts and like that music comes on. <laughs> And everybody's just yeah! like, yeah. yeah. Sometimes Dude. the game would like flash and you'd have to hit reset. Yeah. Do you yeah. remember that? And yeah. then it would stop flashing. Like yeah. it had tracking, like blip, blip. Oh my God. Tracking. I don't miss that. We're going to skip so much of my childhood here. Also shout outs to the gold cartridge of the original legend of Zelda punch out. Ooh. Double dribble. There's some hockey bullshit game I loved, and so many more. Like it's, it, it, we're skipping a lot, but I, I loved this system. Still do. Hell yeah! By the way, I don't think that blowing thing was actually good for this. It's what made it work. <laughs> well, I think it, it came worked. out later on that it was so much worse for your games. Like blowing moisture <laughs> oh, into your games made all the contacts bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I want to get Stevie involved in this conversation more. So let's move over to the SNES slash Sega Genesis era of video gaming. 
Now, around this time, fighting games started to get really popular, and I played a bunch, some better than others. One of the lesser fighting games I played, but I had, and I'll talk more about that in a second, was a game called Clay Fighter. So good. <laughs> Stevie, talk to me about Clay Fighter, please. Clay Fighter is one of the original fighting games I played as a kid. And I brought this up on the, like, the spoilers episode, Corey, where me and like one of the neighborhood kids were playing this game. We actually ended up getting in a fight while playing it. And I just remember kicking his leg mercilessly to the point where he cried and ran home. And that kid moved like out of town like two months later. And that's how I remember that game. <laughs> you beat some kid up because of Clay Fighter? You goddamn right! He was talking mad trash, and he kicked me first. It's not like I just, like, spontaneously kicked him. It, it was his, like, he started it. Let's put it that way. It was a kicking fight. Yeah. <laughs> An old-fashioned kicking fight. You know, I took, you know, the old axe to the tree and just wore him down. <laughs> it's just because you wouldn't let go of your controllers, just still playing Clay Fighter the whole time. But why did why did this kid just stand there and take it though? Like, was he up against the fence? No, he was. We were like in my basement. He was bigger than me. I think I just kicked him with all my might to the point that he he just got dead leg. He couldn't move. And uh, yeah, what a fucking bully. <laughs> <laughs> you pulled a uh, kickboxer on him, like he's the tree, and you're Jean-Claude Van Damme. <laughs> exactly. We're going to have nothing but Jean-Claude Van Damme references the entire time, but that's, that's exactly what it is. For our younger listeners, though, Clay Fighter has these characters that are so cartoonish. Names like Blue Suede Goo and Ichibod Clay. and Ichibod Clay, Blob. yes. Dude, you, there's no way you should get mad while playing this game. That's what makes it so funny to me. Like these, It's just so utterly ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> it's ultimately not a great game. It's not. It's gimmicky, but it's hard to control. It's not very fluid like a Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat. It's, it's kind of wonky, but it's, it's almost like a parody of a fighting game. And that was kind of the appeal. Is this one of those games that you remember? <laughs> It, it, like, it's not like it's not like it was yeah. a good game by any stretch, like you said. You just kind of remember it. That's so weird. Was this game released, let's say, like around the same time in the '90s, where we started getting stuff like Nightmare Before Christmas <laughs> that had this like clay stop motion shit? Like, is that why it was so gimmicky at the time? Because otherwise, like, clay sucks. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it rode the tales of Mortal Kombat 2, which is another game we may get to, Corey. Oh yeah, very shortly, definitely. And the thing with Clay Fighter, Jonathan, is that you could be characters that were like Clay Blobs. There was one called Blob, I think, and then there was another one called Taffy. And you could, like, <laughs> warp into objects and then hit the enemy. So that was part of the gimmick, but also it was meant to be, like, kind of funny. All right. Yeah, there was, like, an Elvis impersonator character that oh, I'm pretty sure no one has ever played ever. <laughs> like, remember the Elvis guy? Blue Suede Goo. What was the snowman's name? Bad, Bad Mr. Mr. Frosty. Frosty. Bad Mr. Frosty. There we go. <laughs> I, I never had a Super Nintendo, so I, I'm way out of my realm. <laughs> so I found a Clay Fighter cartridge at recess in the grassy area. You know, a big, big, vast grassy area, of course. That's in the back. where it belongs. <laughs> 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 Pretty much. It's not great. But, like, I honestly just found an SNES cartridge, and, like, I couldn't tell you how happy I was to find one. Like, who finds an SNES cartridge outside? <laughs> Dude, some poor schmuck was out there, like, showing his video game to his friends. <laughs> Look what I got for my birthday! <laughs> Fucking lost it on the playground. Dude, he probably got his ass beat when he got home. <laughs> God damn it, Billy, you fucking lost the game in school. I totally imagined, like, some guy had, like, some, like, cliche, care like, movie moment where he's, like, and now, Clay Fighter, he, like, buried it intentionally, like, you will help somebody onto the path. <laughs> like, go on, be free. And then I heard the Jumanji drums, and I found it. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Jonathan's right, though. These games were all $60, early 90s money. Like, these weren't cheap. Clay Fighter was not cheap to be able to pick from eight terrible characters. Like. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I'm telling you, I found this game, right? The story doesn't end there. 
I take it home, I play it. I'm 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 like this is really cool, a free game and it's a new game because I only had like the six games anyway. <laughs> I was telling my friend about it at school like a couple days later. And he tells me, "Oh, that's my game." I was like, "What? It's yours?" And he's like, "Yeah. Can you bring it back to me tomorrow?" I was like, oh, "Okay, I guess." So I bring it to school and I give it to him. And then it wasn't until like the next school year I was like, "Wait a minute." That probably wasn't his. He just wanted that fucking game. Yeah, he fucking finessed <laughs> you, dude. <laughs> I got hustled out of Clay Fighter. What uh, what school were you going to? Bard Elementary. Who's the kid? I don't remember. Oh, fuck that kid. Let's <laughs> <laughs> check him down. Fuck that now grown man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He did some shady shit back in the day, yeah, man. He's probably in jail for doing this shit like that now. <laughs> he's hustling people out of toilet paper in the joint. It was a pyramid scheme. Yeah, it got him in prison. But fighting games were very much popularized by Mortal Kombat. Now, Josh, me and you have discussed Mortal Kombat at length. Well, review do, Josh. I'm sorry. There's two yeah. of you here. <laughs> Why don't you tell me about some of your experiences with the early Mortal Kombat games for Sega, Super Nintendo? This is one of those games me and my brother used to stay up very late playing. And I, I remember us just passing the controller back and forth. We never beat a Mortal Kombat game growing up. We would just see how far we could get. We you were, never beat one? My brother was never good at games, and I, I was too young to really comprehend how to, how to really fucking play games sometimes. A little later on, I, I became... P pretty competent, I would say. Uh, how to how to uh, how to video game? Yes, but I remember us getting stuck on Kentaro from Mortal Kombat two for like I seriously think like two straight hours. He was a cheating ass. Like notoriously, Mortal Kombat two is like slightly rigged, isn't it? Yeah. Well, Mataro, the sub boss from Mortal Kombat three, is. Even more so. He's absolute bullshit. Like, reflects your projectiles, can just randomly hop on you. His hits take off, like, half your health bar. I know the trick to beating him, Josh. If you're Jax, you have to take off your metal arms and believe in yourself. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> you know my dad, obviously, Corey. Oh, yeah. And so my dad being a gamer far more than I ever was... I, my fondest memories of playing Mortal Kombat 1 and 2, which 2 I had for Sega CD, by the way. Toasty! It was just my dad beating the shit out of me in Mortal Kombat to the point that I was just like, fuck this game, and I never wanted to play again. Like, what a jackass. But, like, Corey knows my dad, so he knows that he would be exactly the kind of guy to do that, you know? Like, I'm not I'm not giving up any wins to a freaking nine-year-old kid. Yeah, Jonathan's dad is not the kind that believes in participation trophies, I'll say that. <laughs> Definitely not. You gotta earn this W, boy. Yeah. But you know what? I I ended up getting pretty good, and I actually beat Mortal Kombat 1 and 2. Holy shit. As a little kid, dude. Like, I think I was probably like 11, maybe, beat Mortal Kombat 2. Nice. Yeah. Gnarly. I'm also a champion of the Outer World. I just want to throw yes. that out there. Yes. <laughs> Brother Josh, just out of curiosity, just a quick thing, who is your character? I had three kind of but ugh, dude that's so tough man because i played it so much like i grind grinded out several of those characters but i loved raiden i really did nice right Liu kang baby scorpion for the win Liu kang for sure Liu kang had the coolest easiest uh fatality i think it was down forward back back x about one body length away from him and you become the dragon and you bite him in half bite it's him so in half, dope yeah. yeah animality that's the snes buttons at least remember his like weird little noises when he would do the bicycle kick and stuff like that when you were fighting if you mess with me i'll kick you in the face <laughs> yeah, yeah weird shit like that <laughs> And then, like, in Mortal Kombat 2, like, if you did, like, a real gnarly uppercut on somebody, the guy would pop out from the bottom corner of the screen. Whoopsie! Yes. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. you always wanted to fight at the, like, 
what was it like the pit or something like that because they had the spikes down below oh yeah. yeah yeah so it was like you know you're playing with your friend like fuck this guy i'm gonna uppercut him <laughs> until he falls off the bridge oh you could send him into yeah. the acid so you guys are talking about the good iterations of mortal kombat see i had mortal kombat on snes which was the watered down version. Mm. So there was no blood. But when you hit someone, like spit flew out <laughs> instead of like huge so they, buckets of blood. So they just rendered it a different color. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like sweat or some shit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And also, when you knock someone into the pit, they landed in between the spikes. Yep. <laughs> so no spike oh, went through no. the body. It was like they fell perfectly. They did turn into a skeleton, though. If you hit him in the acid, they would become a skeleton, though, Corey. Yeah, you got Makes that. Makes a lot more sense why my dad bought the Sega instead of the Super Nintendo. Now. Definitely. Yeah. I didn't know where to put it because there's a bit of crossover between Sega and uh, the SNES, but Street Fighter and Primal Rage, the <laughs> other uh, the, the dinosaur fighting game. Yeah. Holy shit, yes. Yes. I mean, Primal Rage was like... It was almost a shittier version of Clay Fighter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, they were stop motion, like, animals. And the gimmick with that game, a, a lot of it was that, like, you can do gross stuff. You can do, like, a fart attack. And you can do, like, a pee fatality. No, <laughs> yeah. golden shower fatality, yuck. <laughs> Donald Trump tapes from Russia, fatality, no. <laughs> the grossest of them all, yeah. <laughs> But I want to I want to go into sports games. I am not a sports guy, but I did play some sports games. One of the most prominent sports games for anyone that played <gasps> games back in the day, Sega or Super Nintendo, was NBA Jam. Oh yeah! Welcome to NBA Jam. Stevie, tell me about NBA Jam. <sighs> NBA Jam, man, especially, I mean, me and Josh are both from Indiana, and basketball is just king here. This game is just so much fun. Two on two, you know, being able to jump 30 feet in the air. <laughs> awesome commentary. Big head mode. Algorithms that make no sense in the game when, you know, you make your first 10 threes, and all of a sudden you go an entire quarter or half, and you don't make another one the entire time. Hold on, <laughs> hold on. That's not true. It's a very, very competitive game, especially if you're playing with other people. Josh actually knew this, that me and your brother and our friends would have tournaments in Florida in spring break. We'd always play NBA GM tournaments. Those tournaments were modeled after the tournaments that we had about five or six years prior. There you go. It passes <laughs> down. And can I just say, one of my earliest memories in my grandparents' condo in Fort Myers Beach, Florida, of NBA Jam is we were having this tournament not earliest memories, just best memories. Having this tournament, eight dudes. We're not down by the pier trying to pick up chicks. We're not trying to sneak <laughs> drinks in the back. We're playing an NBA Jam tournament. In the championship game, CJ Schaefer loses. Scott Skiles in the corner hits a tray. Kaboom! <laughs> One of the all-time moments in sports history. <laughs> <laughs> he kicks the door open, goes out there, and he says, they cheat. They cheat for the magic and he throws a chair <laughs> off the deck to, down to the lower floors from downtown and a later uh, like a stranger who was staying across the way later told our superintendent that she was very frightened when she saw that happen because <laughs> she, <laughs> she saw the anger of satan in this man's eye or in this kid's eyes <laughs> as he was out on the deck. <laughs> how old was he Oh, we were in junior high. Okay, that seems like a junior high move, yeah. Get frustrated over NBA Jam, toss yeah. a chair off. I want to also say that Stevie and I are from, you know, small town northern Indiana, whereas Corey is, like, from L.A. and all that stuff. But we had one of the players from our very high school in the game, one of the <sighs> best players in the game, Sean Kemp. Best players of all time. And another player that I mentioned a minute ago, Scott Skiles, is like from a high school right down the way. So it was like super, like we had these kind of touch points with it. And the fact that the Bulls were the, they were the best team in the game, even though they didn't have Michael Jordan 
and it came out like 25 years later that the game did have an algorithm in it that cheated for the Bulls and the Pistons. It's just pretty funny in hindsight. What a great <laughs> game. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I remember the Bulls. They didn't have Jordan, like you said. That was kind of weird. They had Pippen and someone else. And they would always be the halftime highlights. No matter what teams are playing, it would always every be like, time was a one handed <laughs> like a one handed jam down the lane, and the guy looks in the camera, and you're horse like, oh, Grant. that's awesome, yeah. And he was Horace Grant, yeah. No matter what teams are playing, Jordan was too fucking stingy to to <laughs> play that game, man, or to be in the game. You mean seriously? He had his own video game going on. Jonathan, what team did you play in NBA Jam? <laughs> Come on, man. From LA. I had to be a Lakers. You have Vladdy? Well, yeah, it didn't matter. We were going to shit on everybody we played against anyway. <laughs> <laughs> LA all day, baby. Getting defensive. <laughs> so I have super fond memories with this game as a kid. This was the game that we got when we bought our Sega CD add on tray for uh, the Genesis, right? So it turned it into like a single console. Um, yeah, that parasitic add-on for the Sega Genesis. <laughs> yeah, made, made it like 20 inches wide. <laughs> and so two super distinct memories. One was there was a player on the Suns named Dan Marley, but it was spelled M-A-J-A-R-E-L-E or whatever. And I'm like, no, it's Dan Majerals. I'm like, they broke the game. And everybody's like, no, his name is Dan Marley. Like, that's just how you say it. I'm like, no, they fucking wrote the game wrong. Like, I was... I was such a stickler for spelling and that's the hill as a kid. that little Jonathan wanted to die. <laughs> oh my God, Dan. dude. I was so mad like that. We had a defective game <laughs> and then I was introduced to the big head cheat code for the first time ever in my life for this game. And yes, we could get shit. big heads for the players. And there was a cheat code to play as Bill Clinton. Damn. Yeah. yeah. The ultimate baller, dude. Yeah. <laughs> ultimate. You couldn't be hill dog though. Unfortunately. So there was a game like NBA Jam that I played more than NBA Jam. It was called College Slam. Oh, yeah, dude. <laughs> it was made by the same company, Midway Acclaim and Iguana. And it played exactly like NBA Jam, but you were college teams, which I didn't give a shit about. I know some people like college versus professional, whatever. I didn't care. <laughs> this game was like NBA Jam on fucking crack. The stuff, the power-ups you can get in this game were insane. You could get a power up where lightning will strike the enemy's hoop, and then they there's no hoop. They shoot, and there's, they can't get points. Oh, that's gnarly. You can turn into a tornado, and you could still hold the ball, and anyone that touches you just gets blown away. There's all kinds of little shit like that. That's awesome. I played it with my friends who were super into NBA Jam, uh, Rory and them. You remember them? Yeah. And uh, they were, like, so fucking mad. They were like, this game is like the most cheating ass game I've ever played. Because I knew where all the power-ups would spawn on the court. So I would just like wait by them and just like grab them and just dominate. They were so fucking mad. One of them was like a, it was a bee and everyone else on the floor would just fall to the ground. Except oh, your car. Yeah, it was the bomb. <laughs> yeah, that's the bomb dog. There was no better moment than inviting a friend over to play a game that you're overly familiar with and just beating the shit out of them. Fourth quarter, break the backboard on them. Just <laughs> dominate. Invite them over to play games and just kick away at their leg. <laughs> it's the way you do it. It's, it's it's how you, you know, it's how you gain dominance over somebody, right? <laughs> Speaking of uh, beating people up, I guess, beat em ups also a huge part of the consoles of this era. Now, there is a lot of beat em ups to talk about, but I know that one of the ones that was very widely played, and by some of you guys as well, was Turtles in Time, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game. The definite upgrade from the NES Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game, by the way. That game was fucking impossible. So hard. Stevie, you were a, a Turtles in Time guy, right? Yeah, I was a really big Turtles dude just in general. But yeah, this game, I absolutely like. I love side scrollers, and this game was a side scroller on crack. Uh, I thought it was just so cool at the time, especially I could throw like people into the frame, and they would like slide down the glass. I thought that was awesome. 
That was a mechanic, too. You had to do that at one point to beat Shredder. Yeah, it was annoying as hell. But this game was also, I mean, especially for someone who was, you know, as young as me at the time, games weren't always fun. And I mean that in a way of... <laughs> you could lose all your lives and start all over again really quickly in a game like this. And there's nothing more frustrating than, like, getting to the train level or the highway level and just losing two lives immediately and starting all over again. And uh, this is one of the games that taught, taught me, you know, games aren't always fun. Sometimes it's a chore, but it's worth it in the end to beat those games. It's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't save in a lot of these old games, yeah. like, at all. It was like, you play it, and if you want to pick it up later, you pause the fucking game and hope that no one, like, bumps the console. Josh, I mean, you're a Turtles guy. This game was so fun. I, I think it was one of the first games, too, that you could, like, really co-op in this way, like, not against each other, but for a common cause. So it was cool to stop playing, like, Mortal Kombat 2, kicking each other's ass, stop doing that battle game for Mario 3, and, like, <laughs> just beat a bunch of, like, foot soldiers to death. It's so fun. With a buddy. I agree. And, you know, I, I didn't have this game but I played it a lot. It's a great, like, soda pop game. Like, you and a few friends, you sit down, you have sodas, and, you know, this is your Friday night or Saturday night or whatever. It's just young kids just trying to beat this game, and you probably never will, but a, a lot of the games I have on my list are, like, definitely fun soda pop games. Let's work together. I really <laughs> like that. Yeah. Like, let's work together as opposed to, like, fight each other. Because when it was a fighting each other game, it's like, okay, who's played this game the most? Okay, you win, pretty much. One of the, like, best pictures of that game is, like, right when it starts, and you say you got, like, two or four people, and everyone's just, like, jumping and kicking downwards and, like, trying out all the moves. Talk about just great times with great friends. Yeah, man. There was a beat-em-up game kind of in that vein, but it was single-player that I liked a lot called Maximum Carnage. It's probably my single favorite Sega Genesis game. It was a Spider-Man game, and it was actually based on a comic, which was kind of rare back then to have, like, to see comic books in TV and video games. It was still, like, I don't know, kind of getting a little bit of notoriety. Like, comics were not the thing they are now. So when you got it, and if you're a comic book fan, it was cool. And this game, it, it cuts to the actual comic it's based on between levels. So it follows the story of the comic, and it was just... To me, it was like one of the great superhero games of the time because you got to be Spider-Man. You got to do all the powers of Spider-Man. You had like the web. You could do the swing. And later on, as you advance, you could actually be Venom. And it's a very specific plot about a specific story. And that game was just great. I didn't know that many people that played it, but big shout out to Maximum Carnage for me. Are you choking up right now, bro? We're here for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just such a beautiful game that's all <laughs> can confirm he's shedding a tear right now <laughs> now review dude Josh I know you played some Final Fantasy which is like a huge franchise right now I guess it has been for a long time but I think the first Final Fantasy game was Final Fantasy 3 right yeah, so there's a bit of, like, um, because in Japan, they didn't really bring all of the Final Fantasy games over to the U.S., so this game is considered Final Fantasy VI in Japan, but it's Final weird. Fantasy III for us, which is weird. I'll keep this brief, but this is the game that really taught me that you can't just pick up somebody else's controller and just start playing. Like, this isn't Mario. You can't... <laughs> you will fuck somebody's game up. <laughs> I got yelled at by a cousin for doing this. Dude, my brothers wiped some of my fucking saved levels, I guess you could say, for Goldeneye. I remember Goldeneye, oh, you could, shit. like... You had, like, three save slots where you can save your progress. And I remember yeah. just, just grinding through that game. We'll talk about Goldeneye shortly, but grinding through that game and then one day finding my brother just deleted it all because he was like a dumbass four-year-old you know he just was mashing buttons oh god oh, i never had to deal with any younger brothers but that, that sounds fucking like a gut punch before we move consoles jonathan there's a couple games i know you wanted to talk about one of which i played 
Toe Jam and Earl. Yeah. And one of which I haven't played, Altered Beast. So why don't you take it away? All right. So Toe Jam and Earl, that was more like my parents played that game. They liked it a lot more than I did. I didn't really know what I was doing playing it, but you kind of had this like exploratory world, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so it was like a top view. There yeah. was two characters. One was called Toe Jam, yeah. which is a very 90s thing to have <laughs> totally. in a game. Like, <laughs> totally. It's like gross and edgy. It's like that game for Sega. There was Booger Man, where you flung boogers at yeah. people. Right. Like, that which, was your that one was super fun. <laughs> <laughs> I still do that in real life. But. <laughs> <laughs> Learned a lot from that game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't really remember a whole bunch about it, but I just remember like fucking around on the game and exploring and kind of going all over not really knowing how to play but for some reason because of the name like i just wanted to play it as a kid that game had like a pretty big map and you can like find little items that either helped you or hurt you it was kind of like a lesser version of zombies ate my neighbors like it wasn't as fast it wasn't as fluid or like well programmed but it was definitely expansive yeah i do have a personal anecdote about that game too if you don't mind Corey. Go ahead. And it was so expansive. You could throw anything from like tomatoes to like a hat with a rabbit in it at people. Like it was just nuts. But me and best friend Drew Rockland, Toe Dam and Earl might actually be like why we are best friends. We just became really close wow. because the origin story. I only played this for one night because it was like one of those like stay at a friend's house and play for like overnight <laughs> and we rented it from pj's video and we played it until like his mom made us go to sleep and we we're so close to the end and we left it on <gasps> and if memory serves me right we woke up the next morning to see that she had come in like later that night and like saw it was on and turned it off oh my god obviously it wasn't saved and we had to return it so we never returned to the game either, so it still lives in legend. We'll sometimes talk about, like, maybe we should pick that up and try to play it again someday. <laughs> if you guys ever get in, like, an epic fight and you stop being friends, just be like, we have to do this one thing first before we go our separate ways. <laughs> we have to beat the game, and then we can shake hands and say goodbye. Uh, Toe Jam and Earl had a sequel game that I remember much more. It was much more of a side-scroller, and it... It was animated better. It was more fluid. I think I liked the second one a little bit more, but the first one was unique in that way. What was Altered Beast, Jonathan? Rise from your grave. So Altered Beast was a game that came out, fuck dude, I was probably like two years old or something like that. Like It was a really old Sega Genesis game. And you were basically in ancient Greece in the ruins of Greece and you were trying to um, play this character that was chosen by Zeus to like save the world or whatever. Um, this sounds epic. Yeah, it was. it's a side-scrolling beat-em-up kind of game, but you would have like these power-ups that you would be able to gain and then you would go from just being this like totally shredded, ripped guy into like start forming into this beast and then it would once you got a certain amount of power-ups, then you would form fully into this beast and it would go altered beast. <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah, it was like super cheesy. And it was awful. But then you get to like the end of each level and you have a boss, right? There's only like five levels, but it was so fucking hard. But this boss for the end level, he was like this massive like worm tremor looking thing, but he had like a devil face and he would like swipe at his face and throw his face at you. And like that would be... That would fuck you up. So you that was his like, attack? Yeah, the that was face boss's toss? attack. Yeah, it was like, take your face off. <laughs> like, that's that what sounds would do. so familiar. Yeah. And uh, so, but you would have to, like, do these crazy attacks at the faces and then try to beat the boss at the same time. Like, it was so hard for a young kid to beat this game. But I'm pretty sure it, if I try to play it now, I'd probably still give up on it. But it was it was like one of those flagship Sega games. It came out, I think, on the release of Sega Genesis. Some of these games are still really hard to play. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we're going to briefly talk about Sega CD. Jonathan, you had a Sega CD. You mentioned that. I also was one of the few people in the world that had a Sega CD. <laughs> Shout out to my mom, actually, 
because she really wanted us to get the next generation console after Sega Genesis, and she wasn't really sure which route to go. I remember there was a like, talk leading up to that Christmas of like which gaming console we were going to get. Sega Saturn was like in the running and like a couple others that fell into obscurity. But we did get a Sega CD. We didn't get the add-on. We got it as a standalone console, something called the JVC XI, which was a Sega CD and Sega Genesis all in one unit made by JVC. Just played both games, obviously. There's a game I want to talk about, but I'm going to go to you first, Jonathan. What did you play on Sega CD? I played a lot of different ones. I remember like Echo the Dolphin and like Aladdin, Lion King, a bunch of really like big, you know, movie games at the time. But so there were two games that I really have fond memories of. One of them being Night Trap, which is a kind of an obscure game. I don't remember. I don't think a lot of people are going to remember this one, but I if I remember correctly, you and I talking about this before, this game was the reason for video game rating going forward. It was a combination right? of Night Trap and Mortal Kombat games. Yeah. Yeah, Night Trap had some pretty like risque stuff in it cuz it actually had real video. Like they filmed real people for Night Trap, right? Yeah. And you saw them on the screen and then you got to kind of choose what happens if I'm understanding correctly, right, Jonathan? Right. You had to like um, go back and forth to different security cameras in this house and protect this house from invaders or something. It was about vampires, right? I think they were just burglars. Yeah, I think they were just breaking into the house. I don't think it was vampires. vampires, But like there were like girls in their like lingerie or like 90s or something in here. And so it was kind of considered provocative. Yes, it was very voyeuristic. Yeah. I remember the the famous moment is like the girl in the lingerie nighty gets like abducted by the burglars. So like they come in the room and they they grab they put their hands over her mouth and like it cuts and it's like game over. And as as you can probably imagine, people are like, wait a minute, what is this game? Like, yeah. you know, a parent sees a little kid play that's like, what is happening in this game right now? Like, are they are they gonna well, hurt that woman? It's no big deal, mom. They're just taking her out and raping her in the van. <laughs> oh jeez. <laughs> And I was trying to beat around the bush a little bit. Well, so were they. <laughs> whoa, whoa. Oh, no. <laughs> this is getting obscene. Oh, man. Anyways, so so there was that game. And I had no clue how to play it as a kid, but I always wanted to try to figure it out. And somehow I liked seeing the girl in the nighty. But the other game I played a lot was Lethal Enforcers. And this was the game that I actually had the guns uh, to plug into the Genesis and play this one. So you were like a, a cop and and you had to, you know, shoot the other guys and shoot for power ups, shoot on the side of the TV to reload. So it's like, like an that. arcade style? Yeah, exactly. It was like very much like an arcade style at home. That would still be so fun, you know it. Absolutely. If, if it was out still, I would probably play it. That out. sounds familiar. Was it a Western style? Were you like a sheriff or a deputy kind of thing? It was, I think, if I remember correctly, had different like scenes where sometimes you were like in an industrial area, sometimes you were in a Western area, and like they were shooting back at you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, those kind of games were fun. What was less fun on the Sega CD were, I think they're called QTE games. Are you guys familiar with that? Quick time event? Yes. Yes. Quick time event games. So a QTE game, which I had a lot of on the Sega CD. My poor mom, you know, she got a bunch of games for the Sega CD. She's thinking, like, this is the next gen shit. Like, these games are going to be amazing. And they were almost all fucking crap. But the one was called The Masked Rider. So The Masked Rider is like a Japanese, like, Power Ranger style old ass TV show. What they did is they filmed footage of that show and they turned it into a game by making it a QTE game. Now what you do in the game is you press an arrow at the right time. So like you have a character running, he's gonna turn right. You have to press the right arrow. Really fucking lame. But not only is the gameplay bad for a game like that, it has some of the weirdest dubbing I've ever heard because it's a Japanese game and they, you know they have like adults voicing the little kids at times and it sounds super weird Dad back yet? No I don't think so. Oh he'll show up. See, see you tomorrow. tomorrow Okay see you tomorrow. Bye 
This game, though, it, it stuck with me for some reason. When I think of Sega CD, I think of the Mass Rider game, even though it's not fun, it's awkward to play. I played it a lot, and I wanted... You basically have to memorize every button you're going to press at every given time. So I tried to memorize the whole game, and I wanted to beat it. I just wanted to, like, succeed at one of these impossible QTE games, and I never did, but the Mass Rider lives in my heart to this day. <laughs> like this song too who made it did quantum dream make it i don't know that's who i was thinking i was like oh man telltale and quantum dream made a fucking career out of qte games yeah they, they're they all qte games and some of them are really good yeah some of them really are really there's good qte games heavy rain is really good so is detroit become human that's really good there's some really good ones. Hey, just to confirm, Lethal Enforcers Episode 2 was the uh, Western one, Corey. I see. So there was a Western version of yeah. it. Yeah. But what's cool about... So these three games that we just talked about is the incorporation of like actual like footage. It wasn't just like video game graphics right like it actually had like real people like real footage inserted into parts of this game that you could see right like like the robbers in the security cameras on um on night trap they had similar things where like on lethal enforcers the guy would come out and it was actually like a guy yeah they captured video for it right and this was like a pretty big deal at the time yeah, I was going to say the only thing I know about Night Trap is the, the live action footage from I, I've seen it on YouTube. It's pretty funny, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's like you said not that many people know about it. Like gaming historians have like discovered it. So it's like more known now than it ever was really back then. Right. <laughs> yeah. But let's move up into the N64 slash PlayStation era. Yeah. I know we all played a lot of games of that era. Stevie, there was a game I know you played a lot called Time Crisis. Why don't you tell us about it? Time Crisis, man, what a time to be alive this was. Um, it came in this big <laughs> box, it looked like a cereal box. And the game was really short. It was only like five levels, like consisting of like three stages per level. And it came with a gun for a controller. And you had to like, you got like a minute per stage. And if you ran out of time, you die. And it was a lot of like ducking back and forth and shooting at the screen. Um, and you like held a, held a button. And I remember like every time you came up to like a certain part of a level, a guy would scream, action! Action! And you'd start <laughs> shooting people. And I loved that game. As an eight year old, I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. That came out in 1998. And then in 1999, Columbine happened. And Stevie no longer had Time Crisis. Oh, you got taken away? <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> Dude. Was your mom worried about you? Um, that was during a lot of, like, video games and rock and roll will turn your kids into psychopaths era. Like, the news was pumping out. And I think, like, my parents bought into that, like, hard. And uh, I just remember that game fondly because I never got to play it again after uh, the events of Columbine. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a, you see that at arcades sometimes, though, right? Or at, at least you did back in the day. I played it every time I was at arcade, yeah. I mean, they're still at arcades. But, I mean, at home, the original Time Crisis on PlayStation, it was like a one-year thing, and it was gone. Dylan Klebold would be sad for you. Yeah, I mean, certain arcade cabinets seem to be, like, timeless. Like, they've been around for, like, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's like almost up there that's one that i've definitely seen a lot I, I didn't even know there was a home version of that game because you need the add-ons i got the cool gun too because it had the gun with like the kickback to it where like the top of it would like shift back and forth i thought that was so cool and i never saw it again mm. another classic shooting game first person I guess the ultimate first person shooter, the one that most people remember as kind of the original, although, you know, depending on your age, you might say Doom or Wolfenstein, but a legendary game, Goldeneye. Brother Josh, you played some Goldeneye in your day, right? I played Doom and Wolfenstein too, but 
this brought it to a whole new motherfucking level. <laughs> We're talking about quad screens with friends, like learning the levels, and you all know all the guns, and there's memes of people putting cardboard that cut the screen in half so that your little brother can't peek to see what you're doing but that <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> no one could actually really do that so like part of the game was you could see the other person's screen at all times odd job being a cheat I don't know if you guys allowed people to be him when you guys played no. what was your stance on odd job <laughs> no no odd jobs <laughs> yeah we allowed it <laughs> An underrated part of GoldenEye, though, Corey, before we maybe go too much more into the multiplayer, is actually the single player. I remember being so fun as a kid. Like, there were missions, but you could kind of do it your own way and take it real slow a lot of times. And I just remember the polygon shapes, if you like aim down your sights at a character and look at them real close, were really hilarious, even <laughs> as a kid back then. But even not on DK mode, like people looked really <laughs> funny. Yeah, they did. I remember, I think level five, I think it was, just like trying to get as many enemies to set off as many alarms as possible and just like bottleneck, like swarms and swarms of these NPCs into this one room and just gun them down and just try to like create a pile of their bodies. It's like you're saying, like you can kind of like have your own fun outside of the missions, uh, much like in like Grand Theft Auto games, which came later. But the multiplayer is what a lot of people remember with GoldenEye. My house rules were you can be anyone. I was always Jaws, which was the tallest guy, which is actually a disadvantage. But I was like, be odd job, be whoever the fuck you want. I will destroy you in this game. <laughs> I don't care who you are. I'll destroy you. I was very confident in that game. And I'm not super good at video games in general. But I made a point to get good at that one. Because it was really popular and I was going to play with friends at other people's houses and stuff. One time I took that game to a friend's house. I don't know if you remember Francisco, Jonathan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I used to I hang do. out with him all the time. Yeah. Well, his little siblings didn't really speak English. Right. But we'd go to his house. Yeah, he barely spoke English. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow, Corey was always friends with the kids that didn't speak English. Yeah. Oh, I had a lot of Mexican friends that, yeah, could, could kind of barely communicate. It made the process easier. Yeah. <laughs> Just give him a nod, you know? Yeah. But, Corey's over here motioning with his fingers, <laughs> kicking somebody's ass. <laughs> Am I? I remember I went to Francisco's house. We plugged in the game, me, him, and like two of his little brothers were playing and they couldn't speak English at all. And I was destroying these little kids and they were getting so mad. And I remember they would spawn. I would like wait at their spawn point. Oh God. And like, I would just gun them down with an AK-47 and they'd be like, no pistola, no pistola. (laughs) That is exactly something Corey would do as a kid, man. What a shithead. I was like, be odd job if you want, bitch. You're going to (laughs) die. If you play that game enough, you know where everything important spawns. I think the most fun we ever had, though, was doing the the no gun, just slaps only. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that shit's fun. I remember battles with proximity mines being so epic. Proximity mines was easily my favorite. Proximity mines at the facility was basically a done deal. Like, you didn't have a chance. Dude, why was the facility and, like, going in the bathroom and checking out that vent, like, so fun? (laughs) So stupid. People would try to hide up there in that vent. Yeah. And I would just toss a proximity mine. It's just the one vent. It's not like an actual building where there's, like, infinite (laughs) vents you could be in. It's one fucking vent. It's just the one. I, I was okay with screen looking too. Like I was like, do whatever you want to try to win. <laughs> like you can look at my screen, you can yeah, be you odd job, to. try to team up yeah. on me, you're gonna get proximity mine down. Yeah. yeah, look at me, I'm not going anywhere. I'm waiting at your spawn. <laughs> <laughs> AK-47 wasn't the best gun in the game though, was it? Absolutely best there is. When you absolutely positively gotta kill every motherfucker in the room, except no substitute. It was one of my favorites though, Josh, and it was the it was the main gun for the proximity mine uh, weapon selection. Uh. 
Another one that I used to play with friends, and this was a crossover game on both N64 and PlayStation, was Rampage World Tour. Now, I, yes. I talked about, like, soda pop games. Like, this is definitely one of them. Like, let's get a six-pack of Coca-Cola, stay up late, and try to beat this game. Because it had just had so many levels. Stevie, you played this one, right? Oh, this was the ultimate soda pop game. This was, like, get a two-liter of Mountain Dew pizza and stay up as late as, you know, your friend's parents would let you and try to beat this goddamn thing. I think it had, like, 100 levels or something. I just remember it being somewhat difficult towards the end. And one thing I really loved about it was just how absolutely chaotic it was on screen. Corey, what character did you play as? Lizzie, the Godzilla. Same. Yeah. <laughs> so I got this game when I got a PS1. At the time, just PlayStation. But um, yeah, that, that like came with the PlayStation when I bought it. Okay. Um, it was uh, it was like a package deal where they offered. Um, came with Gran Turismo, which was like the elite racing game at the time. Like nothing was better than that when the first PlayStation came out. And DualShock controllers and Rampage World Tour, and that was my very own first setup. That's that I right. paid for with my Dual money. Shocks. But we had to put it in the damn living room because I <laughs> couldn't have a TV in my room at the time. <laughs> That's right. That was like a hard thing to get, right? The PlayStation at the time? Yeah. Like, I mean, just as bad as people were waiting for consoles to come out now, the same thing happened then. It's still hard to get a new PlayStation. Yeah. There there was no order online back then. Like you had to know somebody to know somebody or else you were like, you know, waiting for that thing forever on 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 a back order. Did Rampage have some nudity in there or am I mistaken in my memory? girl in a shower there was people in showers i remember that yeah okay something like that well you're like destroying buildings a lot mm-hmm. and you i remember you would break open windows and there would be people and you would grab them and eat them so you're saying some of those people were a woman in a shower yes nice it'd be funny if she's like really old <laughs> Can confirm there were naked old men and women. <laughs> it says old. No, I'm looking at the pictures of them now. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, dude, they're like they're like eight bit fucking <laughs> pictures of old men and women naked. Like yeah. you don't, you can't see anything. It's just like a solid color for the body. Therefore, they're naked. Yeah. Oh, but you can zoom in and enhance. <laughs> Camera, enhance. That was enough back then, Corey. That was enough. Oh, this guy, somebody pointed, put an arrow on this picture. It says, digital wang. You can see it. <laughs> wow, he's right. <laughs> dude, this guy's packing, dude. He's like three pixels long. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Mario Kart 64. Now, Mario Kart is a game that I didn't own, but basically every friend I had that had an N64 had Mario Kart. And I remember there being some pretty, like, fun glitches in this game. Like, there was, like, a dirt road map where you could, like, hop over the wall. Yeah. And it was hard to do, so, like, you'd have to spend a lot of time doing it. But if you did do it, you'd go really far ahead of other people. Review Dude, did you play some Mario Kart in your day? Oh, yes. Red and blue tortoise shells all day, motherfucker. Uh, The green ones were really hard to aim because they, yeah. I knew people that could do it, though. It could be done. Yeah, you had to be, like, directly in front of them or really good at ricocheting or, yeah, it was was a little trickier to maneuver, but it was possible. But, yeah, I remember that was one of the games. Well, Nintendo 64 is when my dad finally said, fuck it, we're going to get a Nintendo. And we got one, and uh, that was a game that all my cousins would come over and play, and uh, we all had just a grandiose time passing around the the rollers. Dude, that was my first experience with actually being able to have like a four player, you know, console. It was like, previously everything was all two player. Yeah. That and Goldeneye, I think, were the first like games that I played four players. I know, if you have both games and it's like, not a school night and you have friends over it's gonna be a fun night 
ordering Papa John's dog, it's going to be a fun Friday. I was more of a Pizza Hut guy, but yes. <laughs> I need to know every single person's go-to driver in Mario Kart 64. You go first. Wario was my boy. <laughs> okay. Yoshi. I bounced from Wario to Bowser. Stevie. <sighs> well, I mean, I still do it. I was always Toad. Yeah, I always had to pick Toad, too, because I feel like it was always a fight for Yoshi. Yeah, it was always Yoshi, and so I was like, you know, I'll just be Toad. And I picked Toad so many times, it's just like, I'll just pick him without a fight now. I was always Damn. Toad. That is my exact experience. I remember my older brother saying Yoshi was faster than everybody. <laughs> I, I, like, read that. the manual at some point, and, like, they did have different traits, like Wario uh -huh. and Bowser could actually go faster, but they didn't have as good handling or some shit. There's oh. always a trade-off, one stat line for another. Yeah. Well, well there's, like, sure. quickness versus, like, top speed that you gotta get up to. Yes. And Toad was just an all-around driver. He was a safe driver. <laughs> My number one memory of a level, though, Corey, is that island with the beach, and you can you have the option <laughs> of jumping the ramp into that cave through the waterfall. It's so yes. cool. I remember as a kid, I could I could do it like all the time. I went back and tried to redo it like a couple years. I'm like, how the fuck did I ever pull this off? Or go back and try to like play Rainbow Road, where you just fall off the edge the whole time and not have a seizure. <laughs> it's so hard, dude. Brother Josh, you wanted to talk about Star Fox 64, which I also had, uh, but why don't you go ahead and go first? Do a barrel roll. <laughs> yes! Dude. The memes? Need I say more? <laughs> the memes? <laughs> I thought that game was really cool. You were flying around in the 3D space, shooting at a bunch of different geometric shapes. You had different characters talking to you, and there's this really cool aspect of between games, Corey. You see this, like, planet system and you're skipping from planet to planet and there's some kind of like mysterious backstory with like your character's dad or something it's almost a little star wars esque it, i had a lot of fun playing this game slippy watch out bogey on your tail whoa help me the cool thing about star fox is that you could get different outcomes you can actually unlock yeah. levels but by doing specific things and I, I could look out sometimes and find out what those were, but like I never really knew how to do it. Like gaming before the internet was huge was like kind of tough. Cause like you, you had to get this shit from like Nintendo Power or word of mouth. And like no one I knew had fucking Nintendo Power. So it's, it's all just like recess talk. And a lot of stuff like people would say was bullshit. Like I remember there being a lot of stuff with like Mortal Kombat games. Like if you do this, you can unlock this guy called fucking Hornbuckle. And I'm like, what the fuck is Hornbuckle? Tom Bombadil's in the game. Tom yeah. Bombadil. Tom Bombadil. <laughs> you can give him the ring and like just leave it with him and Middle Earth will be saved. I remember like every once in a while going to like a comic book shop or something and you could get like a cheat code book or whatever or a tips book that would cover like all the games that came out for the past the year Shark. or something like that yeah yeah it was really cool i got a couple of those i think yeah you're right and there were also like game specific strategy guides that yeah. like yes. really just walked you through how to do everything you need to do in a game and that's really the only reason i was able to beat the water temple in ocarina of time wow. i would not have beaten that fucking level if it hadn't have been for a strategy guide were any of you guys into ocarina of time that was one of the games I, I would go over friends or cousins, and I never play like uh, beat it personally, but I would watch it be played and like play it a little bit when the controller got passed to me. It was cool. It was one of the first games I remember like having a lot of freedom in. Like you could just ride your horse around and like hunt ghosts, or you could go fishing. You could just try to catch like the biggest fish and turn it in for a reward in the game. They had a lot of like small details that made that game fun. It, very like. Like I said, open world. Like you can kind of do what you want. You're just put into this land and you can go anywhere or you can follow the main story. It was pretty cool. I was going to say Star Fox, the, the branching planet thing, is probably the first time I ever remember getting anxiety as a kid, like playing a game. I was like, oh God, how do I, how do I get to the other, th the other thing? 
one of the levels that you can unlock, you're actually not in a, a ship. You're in a tank. Oh, shit, yeah. I yeah. barely remember that one. Oh, fuck, yeah. Josh, I know that you are very into fighting games, and uh, around this time, Tekken was huge. You were a Tekken player, right? Oh, uh, review dude, Josh? Yes. <laughs> That's why I said, uh, I am the fighting game kind of guy. I, I fucking love fighting games. And uh, around this time the PlayStation was <clears throat> released, my dad, wanting to be different, decided to get a fucking Dreamcast. So Tekken was yeah. something that I would have to go over to my cousins and play, and they would come over to our place and play, like, Street Fighter Alpha 3 or Mortal Kombat 4 or some shit like that. But, uh, yes, Tekken 1 and 2... I really got into going over there. And, of course, the famous Shaun of the Deadline, the, the time we stayed up all night drinking apple schnapps, playing Tekken 2. <laughs> Relatable. Yeah. Yes. I didn't like Tekken, though, because it looked like shit. Like, that game looks like <laughs> Polygon Nightmare. Like <laughs> It was way better looking than Virtual Fighter. Virtual Fighter was bad, too. I might be mixing those up, actually. Virtual Fighter is famously bad. Stevie, did you play Tekken though? Oh yeah. So my dad, the rule in the house was, I mean, when I got a PlayStation, it came with a Crash Bandicoot, who was, I mean, the mascot for PlayStation forever. Um, and the rule in the house was, if I wanted another game, I had to beat the games I already owned. So I would <laughs> take it one at a time. <laughs> wow, what a rule. That was the rule. That's sadistic. So like, Getting through Crash Bandicoot as like an eight-year-old kid was a nightmare because the first one was really hard in a lot of levels and there wasn't a whole lot of save points. You know, you ran out of lives, it's, you know, back to square one, it sucked. And so I got done, you know, with Crash Bandicoot and I wanted Tekken. And so I beat Tekken and, you know, I go say, hey dad, I beat Tekken. And he said, no, you didn't. And then the rule became, you can't get another game until you beat me. And <laughs> oh, no. my dad owned me for months. I mean, I would never beat him in Tekken. I mean, I, I spent hours upon hours mastering characters trying to beat the sadistic bastard. <laughs> and eventually... Sounds like he was being a cheap ass. Yeah, moving the goalposts, that's oh, not yeah, fair. Right? 100%. And the thing was, my dad was a savant at fighting games. <laughs> he could just pick oh, no. one up and be so good. And so I'll say this. I don't toot my horn about a lot of like games in general, but you know, if there's ever a Tekken game around, I will beat anybody within a hundred miles of me. <laughs> I am just that good at Tekken because I played every Tekken. I've beaten every Tekken there is. And I went undefeated in college. So I can thank my dad for that at least, that his yeah. cheap assness turned his son into a Tekken master. Stevie, I have a question for you. Yeah. If you were to pick one game, life was on the line, would it be Tekken? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like if, yeah, if Jesus came down from the sky and said, hey, if you want to get in, you have to beat me at Tekken, I would, I would be in, like I would get like a first class trip to heaven. Would you rock his shit or what? <laughs> oh, I would, like, I would be making massive side bets with Jesus the entire time. Beat him like it's the crucifixion. I'd be like, dude, do you still want to rule the kingdom? Do you still want to rule the kingdom? Double or nothing? <laughs> hey, Moses, you want to get in on this? <laughs> Corey would be spawn killing Jesus. <laughs> Stevie, I think your old man and Jonathan's old man should get together and go bowling. Oh, my God. <laughs> Like it, when he said, I thought I, like, when I, the f main evil character's name was Hayachi. And when I, I beat him, I was so excited. Like, Dad, I beat him, I beat him. And he was like, Well, no, you didn't. And just. It became life imitates art, kind of, or art imitates life. Yeah, just the cruelty of. <laughs> My dad became Hayachi. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> you won't get another game until you beat me. And he just rock owned my shit for months. He threw you down a volcano. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> Corey, we skipped one of the game. We skipped the game where my anecdote would have been about my father doing this. But like, it's very comforting to know we all grew up in a similar way because <laughs> like, I think our dad's just not taking it easy on us did something to our young brains that changed how he grew up. And I'm not even joking. 
In Tecmo Super Bowl, my first memory of it, besides my dad kicking my ass in that game over and over, is the very first time we opened it up. It was fucking Christmas, right before we went over to my grandparents' house. We turned on the game. We didn't know that you had to go to preseason mode to actually pick any team in the game. So we just picked season, and he got to be the Buffalo Bills, and I had to be the Tampa Bay Bucks. And I didn't finish the first quarter before I just burst out like in tears, crying, <laughs> leaving the room. How would you like it if you had to be the Tampa Bay Bucks on Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't care. He said, turn it off, load it up. We're going to Grandma and Grandpa's. <laughs> so like were their stats like really like Oh dude. Played down. Was your dad Thurman Thomas? <laughs> Buffalo Bills were one of the top two or three teams in the game. And it was just yeah. random how it turned out that way. But he was like forcing me to be this team and just get like tackled and sacked every time. I was just so sad, dude. <laughs> oh my God. Since we're on dad stories, I got to share one now too. <laughs> oh no. So, like, I used to always try to get my dad to play games with me. I was a PlayStation guy and he was an Xbox guy. So, I would always have like Tony Hawk's pro skater, stuff like that. Right. My dad, no fucking way. That game's fucking stupid. Let me know when you can beat <laughs> Halo with no cheat codes beginning to end. Like, cause he was that guy that would stay up late at night just so he could play Halo. Like, I don't even know how many times he beat that stupid fucking game. But like, <laughs> I hate Halo to this day just because my dad beat it. And I fucking hate Xbox, dude. Fuck that shit. <laughs> Damn. So he wouldn't play games with me because I wouldn't play Halo. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to touch on Tony Hawk a little bit in a moment, but my memories of my dad and video games go back to NES because he got me the NES. He got me the Super Nintendo, but he didn't like buying new games. So th what he would do to get games is he would buy games off my cousin. So basically he would say... <laughs> These are all the games I don't like. And he would sell them to my dad for 20 bucks. So I would have all the shittiest possible games <laughs> for, for NES. And so for he game stopped your dad. <laughs> Dude, truer words have never been said. So my, my dad didn't like to play video games with me, but that's okay. I kind of like to play them alone anyway. But there was an NES game. I know we're going back a few steps here, but an NES game I had called Top Gun. Very loosely based on the movie Top Gun. It had the same music. That's about where the similarities end. But it's a flight simulator game. And after each level, you have to land your jet on an aircraft carrier. And it's the most fucking impossible task ever. I've never done it. I've, I've gone back and tried to do it like as a young adult on an NES and I couldn't do it. It's so fucking hard, but my dad could do it. He did it for the first time I asked him, could you try this? He just did it flawlessly. <laughs> oh no. So I'd be playing Top Gun and it'd be landing the plane. I'd be like, dad, dad, come in here. And he'd like come in and he'd be like, land the plane. And he'd just like button tap, plane lands perfectly. It was amazing. Like I had no idea how the fuck he did this. Dads just know how to do stuff. It's weird, right? Yeah. Is it possible he was playing late at night secretly, though? One hundred percent. That was really my dad, dude. He was doing that shit late at night after everybody went to bed. I know for a fact he was down there playing Dave Mira's BMX on the Xbox after my after I went to bed. My dad was one of the types that like uh, would stare at the like the sky doing three sixties. Like, how do I how do I make a move? <laughs> <laughs> like the inept, like boomer yes. that picks up a video game. <laughs> yeah, that that was my dad. <laughs> Jonathan, I know you played a lot of Tony Hawk back in the day. We were both California skater boys, although I was basically not because I sucked so fucking bad. You remember how bad I was on a skateboard? I how could I ever forget? I was fucking <laughs> pathetic. You could roll. That was cool. I could film. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got a participation award. Yeah, I was I was relegated to the cameraman because I couldn't do it. But Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, tell us about it. I mean, what a legendary game for the PlayStation, you know, console. I think what four games? I think. Uh, even more than that. Yeah. 
I mean, I even bought for my son's PS4, I bought the remastered Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 just to put it in and shit on him the way my dad did to me. <laughs> dude, it was awesome. He's like, Dad, this game sucks. I'm like, dude, this is the best fucking game in the world, man. <laughs> like, he's over here playing like Madden 21 and shitting all over me. Well, you know, a little 10 year old kid, man. And so I, I had to get him back a little bit. But I mean, this game was just so amazing at the time. Like it really influenced like all the skateboarding I was doing at the time. The music was amazing because it was like a lot of variety. Motorhead. It was different. Yeah, it was the first introduction to Motorhead. Yep. And uh, Jonathan. It, it was just so fun. Do you think it's also it was like that competitive edge of a lot of these games we're talking about was kind of taken away? Do you think that's part of why we liked it? It was more just you could free flow, skate around. Yeah, there are points involved and stuff. But. See, yeah, see, I wasn't really, I, I wasn't like an RPG kind of guy. I didn't enjoy the the Halo and stuff like that so much. Like, really, the only one that I liked like that was like Metal Gear. But I really enjoyed the, the free world, so to speak, kind of games where you you just kind of played your own missions at your own leisure. And if you didn't want to, then you were just there fucking around. And I think that was like, that's like an intro into Grand Theft Auto. Like, cause that came out around the same time. Like that free roaming platform was like, that was my kind of game. Yeah. The sure. open worldness of it is was a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, it's like, you don't have to do X. You can just play, you know, you can just skate around. You can do tricks. You can drive around and pick up hookers. Yeah. Kill them and then take them let's, let's talk about that, Jonathan. <laughs> because I played Grand Theft Auto, and it was a game called Grand Theft Auto. It was no one, two, or three. It was just Grand Theft Auto, and it was a PC game. And I thought you introduced me to it, but I might be misremembering. No, I never played Grand Theft Auto 1. I moved up to North Oxnard in like 99 and my next door neighbor had Grand Theft Auto 2 for PlayStation and that was my introduction into Grand Theft Auto. Okay. I never played the first one. So for people that don't know, Grand Theft Auto was a completely different game back in the day. 1 and 2 were way different than what it is now. Yeah. It was a top view, but it was a huge map. But you were just this little peon, this little sprite character <laughs> and you would pick up guns and you would kind of go around shooting people you would try to do missions but in the first game the missions were next to impossible like you couldn't really progress that far. at least i couldn't I absolutely was... the same in the second one okay but in the second one on playstation you could push the square button and it would make him fart on command like every time so that's, that's the worst <laughs> worth the price of admission alone absolutely yeah. <laughs> i remember seeing grand theft auto 2 at your house and just being like wow this is the most amazing upgrade to a game I've ever seen. Because in the first game, you could only get two guns, regular gun and machine gun. Yeah. And in the second game, you get like <laughs> fucking proton packs straight out of Ghostbusters and shit. Like you get some, you get to do some really cool shit in the second game. I think you see the Molotov cocktails for the first time too. In the Absolutely. Game. Yep, you sure do. I was not prepared for the direction that franchise went at all. Like that <laughs> game became something totally different. And I still like to tell kids that play newer Grand Theft Auto games. I used to play Grand Theft Auto 1 back in the day. <laughs> the map was so big, you couldn't drive across it. <laughs> we topped out at 22 miles an hour. <laughs> Gas was expensive in those days. Yeah. <laughs> Don't know how lucky you have it. Jonathan, me and you grew up on wrestling, and I know you talked about that shitty NES wrestling game, but you had another shitty wrestling game for PlayStation. <laughs> I had several <laughs> shitty wrestling games for PlayStation. You never had the good which, ones. I had the good ones. Yeah, you had good ones. I had shitty ones because that was all I could afford at the time. Because <laughs> if I wanted to buy games, like I had to use my own money. Like my parents didn't buy me games, so um, I bought what I could afford. And I actually sent you like a few years ago a picture. I was going through the garage and I found those old PlayStation games. I don't know if you remember that, but I had Warzone which was actually a pretty decent game. I disagree. In my opinion. Well, you had the better one, so, you know. <laughs> out of the ones I had, Warzone was the best. But I also had WCW Monday Nitro, which I thought was fun anyways. Pretty and good. And then I had WCW NWO Thunder. Okay. Um, those were the three wrestling games I had. But I never bothered taking them to your house because you had the better games. They were way more fun. Yeah, we had... Uh... 
WrestleMania 2000. I mean, there was a few games by that company. It was uh, THQ and AKI, if I remember correctly. Oh, yes. WrestleMania 2000 and No Mercy. Yes, No Mercy came out later, Josh, although I didn't have that one. From what I understand, that was like where they peaked in that series of games. I had the one just before it. I had both. You had both. Okay. Uh, Maybe you can tell me about No Mercy, because I I don't quite understand how it could get better than WrestleMania 2000. Like, that game... I, I've never played a more fluidly controlled wrestling game. Like, you can customize, like, everything you do in that game. It was amazing. Absolutely. Uh, it's more or less just the same. It's just, like, an updated roster, but it's basically the same game. Oh, okay. Uh, in terms of gameplay function. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of memories playing that game with my brothers and my cousin Johnny. You remember my cousin Johnny? Yeah, I remember playing with, with Johnny and, and Shane was here every once in a while and and we were you know after a long day of skateboarding we'd come back to your house over on uh gina drive yeah man that was like we used to call it gina drive (laughs) (laughs) you you did yeah those were the days though man a lot of good memories of that like just like playing that game like you said like after like playing outside for a while like let's go in and cool off and like play this like yeah it was just great like i remember me and johnny were like really closely matched in that game and it was like it was like nerve wracking. It was almost anxiety inducing trying to beat Johnny because he was like as good as me. And the fucked up thing was he didn't even have that game. So he would just come <laughs> over to my house and he was just like a natural. Yeah. That kid was such a natural at so many things. Like he could just pick something up and just be amazing at it. I was always so envious of him. Always. He was so good at everything he did. Yeah. I think that's why I had to play like Tyler and, and Robert. Brothers. Yeah, yeah. Because like those were the only kids I could beat. I couldn't beat you at it. Didn't one of those uh, PlayStation wrestling games, like, couldn't you be, like, Santa Claus or, like, some weird, like, guest characters, like, Frankenstein or some shit like that? Not in the ones I played. Were there any, like, weird characters like that? I don't remember, but I I faintly remember, like, there being some kind of cheat codes that you could activate for some of those games. Tony Hawk 2 had, like, Wolverine or some shit, or maybe Tony Hawk 3, which that, to me, was, like, amazing, Mm because, like... X-Men characters were kind of like not as popular by the time those games came out. And the fact that randomly you could just unlock Wolverine in a fucking skateboarding game was amazing. Yeah. But maybe we should move it along to the PlayStation 2. Stevie, you played a game that you listed that I've never heard of called Shadow of the Colossus. You've really never heard of this game? No. Me either. I think it's like a top 20 game of all time across all systems. I'm familiar with it, but I've never played it. Yeah, so this game, how do I describe it? There's no, like, soldiers. It's nothing but bosses. And it's 15 boss fights on this huge, massive map. And each boss is, like, literally the size of a skyscraper. And there's, like, different levels that go within beating a boss, but it's a ton of fun. It's a Japanese game. Let me put it this way. It's a PS2 game that looked like a PS3 game at the time. What's your character like? A little dude with a gun or something? No, um, it's a kind of a peasant guy named Wanderer. Pretty much uh, he has this sword that shines out the light that tells you which way like the next boss fight is. I mean, part of the game too is there's a lot of the levels and maps that you can't see the light and you kind of have to find on your own where these bosses are at. It's a really cool game. I just looked at a screenshot and it actually looks pretty fucking like ahead of its time it is very much ahead of its time as far as i know and i again i never played it but the boss fights are kind of like puzzles as well right yeah there's a lot of thought that goes into beating these bosses so just to back up stevie on this not by my opinion but this is by a quick search it's this game's got a couple different ratings one of them as a five out of five by somebody dk oldies another 91 percent metacritic rating and 94 percent google user rating okay yeah. so yeah that does sound like an all-timer I, when i called it the masterpiece Corey, i wasn't kidding like it's a legitimate masterpiece it sounds really cool. It sounds like one of those things that i would like to go back and play which is not true for a lot of these games by the way <laughs> Especially anything NES, like the difficulty is just basically through the roof. But as I understand, Xbox came out around the same time as PlayStation 2. Is that, am I right on that? Are those two like equivalent consoles? Yes. 
And GameCube. Yes. I forget GameCube. Oh my god, the GameCube. I did forget GameCube on the list. <laughs> <laughs> I have some GameCube stuff to talk about, but I think maybe next time we pick this up, I'll go over GameCube. It's okay. The entire world forgot about GameCube anyway. <laughs> hey, so it's okay. No, man. I can I have some shit to say about some GameCube games that are amazing. I forgot about Dre and GameCube. <laughs> Don't you guys think Dreamcast probably deserves a spot? We mentioned it, but I mean, come on. The one thing I will say is like around the time the Dreamcast came out, I think the PlayStation 1 and the N64 were on the market at the time. And the Dreamcast was the only one that could run fighting games in their arcade version. Fighting games before them were like very condensed versions of their arcade counterparts. Right, they were slower, if I remember correctly. Yes. That was most noticeable in Street Fighter games, like how fucking slow yeah. they went on the home console. Street Fighter Alpha 3, oh my god, on the Dreamcast was so good. Review, dude, did you ever play Gauntlet Legends for Dreamcast? No, I did not. It's just one of those classic arcade, like, level-up games. Oh, Is it like a chaotic shooter? No, you can be like Green Dwarf or like Blue Mage, and you just like go through level by level, just grinding shit. Oh, that sounds so fun. I played a lot of fucking Power Stone. <laughs> yeah, Power... Oh my gosh. Blast from the past. <laughs> right? Awesome. Yes. The uh, Like I said, the fighting games on the Dreamcast were next level. And in fact, once uh, Sega went under at, with the Dreamcast... Xbox, Microsoft kind of bought a lot of that catalog, and the original Xbox very much really is just the Dreamcast 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> well, Josh, why don't you tell us about some of the games of this generation of console that you played? I think you were an Xbox guy, right? I was an Xbox guy, and I think... The main game we got to talk about, really, is Halo. Yeah. Jonathan's nemesis. <laughs> man, <laughs> man, fuck that game. <laughs> it's such a big game that even though it's a first-person shooter, it it's like copying GoldenEye in a way. It like just took that to a new level, I feel like. And I think, weirdly, Josh Review Dude, don't you think it was like the use of the double stick? that kind of did that with the controllers yeah oh it was so fucking innovative at the time right it, it, it allowed for s such a, a fluid control made aiming so much easier because like what were we doing on goldeneye i think to aim around you have to like hold r and then aim with the right stick Whereas in on oh, Xbox, yeah. you're walking and strafing with your left stick, and you can just completely look anywhere with your right stick. Is that correct? Is that pretty close? Yes. Yes. One fond memory I have of Halo, I remember st the day I got it, I remember staying up all fucking night and beating it, and the big third act twist in the game completely caught me off guard. I remember, like... My cousin had fallen asleep on the couch at the time. I, I remember waking him up like, holy shit, wake the fuck up. <laughs> this is an interesting game because there is like a pretty cool story within it. And a lot of these games we mentioned are fun and have good memories and are nostalgic for different reasons. But the story of Halo, there's like just enough there that it's actually pretty intriguing. And that's just outside of the gameplay itself, which is oh, yeah. also epic. There's also like all these like uh land parties made because of halo so a lot of people have memories of land parties and playing with like 16 people in someone's basement i have really warm memories of doing that and then there's also like these mini series people made online i think one was called red vs blue did you ever watch that review dude Oh, I love Red vs. Blue. I think I watched the first seven seasons. Eventually, I did fall off. But yeah, I, I really liked Red vs. Blue. Uh, I remember my cousins came over to my house one time. We were out of town, and when we got home, they left a note like, Hey, we took your Xbox and Halo. What the fuck? Like a ransom note? Yeah, basically. I was like, are you, are you fucking serious? <laughs> Play oh, outside. 
I, I got to share a quick story. Similar. Sorry. I remember when I got the PS2, my best friend at the time that lived by me, like I thought I was your best friend. You didn't know, but you were not the one that lived by me. <laughs> so anyways, the other guy, Damn. <laughs> the one I was cheating on you with. Uh, I always suspected there was someone. <laughs> it's all true. <laughs> So, this is like couples therapy. I'm glad we're doing this. Yeah, okay. We've all talked about our dads. This is great. I'm glad we're here. <laughs> Seriously. This is great stuff. Yeah, this, this is like some serious group therapy. Here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so after this, this guy was not my best friend in the neighborhood anymore. Yeah. Fucker. He came over and was like, oh, our other neighbor's spending the night at my house. Can we borrow your PlayStation and your games? And I'm like... How the fuck are you going to go over here and ask me to borrow my PlayStation and my games and you're not inviting me to spend the night? Oh, well, it's like, it's just us, man. And I'm like, no, fuck you guys. Get out of here. You're not borrowing my PlayStation, losers. Get the fuck off my porch. Yeah. <laughs> man, what a bold fucking move. Right? <laughs> yeah. I would have never done that. I don't like it, but I respect it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you guys were talking about the controllers for Xbox and Halo and like, some other games as well. But I just want to quickly say, going back, that the N64 controller was bullshit. The way that controller was designed, yeah, it worked, and you could like get good at stuff still, but it never really stopped being awkward. That controller's a fucking nightmare. <laughs> Maybe it was really good for small Japanese hands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the real market, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, with the GameCube, they were like... They're like, let's take the N64 controller and make it worse. <laughs> I like the GameCube controller. Oh, fuck you. That thing's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Bitch, I have GameCube controllers for my Nintendo Switch. Like, that's how much I like that controller. I hate that controller wow. so much. <laughs> Dude, the way to run from side to side in Goldeneye, which is a huge thing. It's called strafing, I think. It's C, yeah. C, left and right. <laughs> those extra yellow C buttons. You have to hit the... Oh my God, those... Fuck those buttons, the C buttons. <laughs> and that weird ass fucking bumper Z button on the back. Are you talking about the yellow buttons, Josh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, those the are the ones C's. that were put there just for baseball games. And they were yeah. awkwardly put into other games. Oh, yes. Those were specific to the Ken Griffey Jr. game. Those were only put in for baseball games. And they were like, well, let's try it for other games, too. When I first played an N64, it was at a Best Buy, and it was Goldeneye. And I couldn't find the trigger button. And I, I looked at the menu that said which buttons to press, and it's the Z button. And I looked at the controller, and I was like, there is no fucking Z button. Z button. I didn't know how to attack. It's on the back of the controller. It's supposed to be like a trigger, but it never really felt like one. No. <laughs> oh, God. I, I feel like the Nintendo 64 controller was just a fucking gimmick. It was. They tried, and it failed. Get that shit out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Stevie, you played some Metal Gear Solid in your day, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, even from just Metal Gear Solid 1 for the PS1, I mean, the graphics of the time in that game were just groundbreaking. They looked so good. And as a young kid trying to learn how to do a stealth game was kind of difficult, but eventually I got the hang of it. So when Metal Gear Solid 2 came out for the PS2, it was like, cannot wait to play a Solid Snake. And what was so great about that game was, and confusing, is you didn't play a solid snake. Oh, I didn't know that. Fooled ya! No, like for literally three quarters of that game you're playing is Raiden. Yeah, I, re I remember that was a whole, like, yeah, it was a marketing gimmick. Pull the rug from under you. Ha ha. And the game actually worked. That game fucks. Like, that's a really, really <laughs> good game. <laughs> it is? <laughs> Wow, what a what a great extra add-on for a game to have. I'm telling you, that's like that's bonus content right this there. This game fucks for only thirty nine ninety nine. <laughs> like once you got past the uh, awkward controls, it's a really really good game. It was sixty dollars, just like all the games were, and will always be. It was yeah, fifty nine ninety nine. It was fifty. 
I usually got mine used at GameStop. <laughs> <laughs> so it's oh, still fuck fucked. Yeah. <laughs> You've also played that, right, Jonathan? Yeah, that was probably the only style game. I mean, I don't even really know. I'm not that much of a gamer, so I really didn't know. What do you, what do you call that? Is that is that an RPG game? Like, what's the name for that, Steve? What type of game is that? Tactical st- uh, stealth espionage. Stealth game. I mean, if you want to get technical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, of, of that sort of you know sub genre of the wider genre of an RPG. That, that was probably one of the only ones that I really enjoyed and, and got into it. And I don't know if it was just like out of necessity because I was over all the rest of the games I had, but um, I really enjoyed a lot of that game. Just learning how to do that stealth stuff was just amazing. I remember watching my cousin play Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater a lot. Uh, yeah. A lot of games that I have memories of, I didn't actually play. I would watch people play. <laughs> <laughs> One of them was a PC game called Alien vs. Predator. And this was a game that existed before that was a movie. Oh, shit. I think it was also a comic. I remember my friend, Ryer, he's on our In the Army Now podcast. He lives in North Carolina. He was amazing at this game, Alien vs. Predator. And it's like a first-person game. You could either be an alien, a predator, or a human, like a marine in like a, a badass mech suit or something. He was always an alien. And just watching him dominate, I felt like, is this like real? Like, are you, like, how is someone this good at a game? He, <laughs> like years later, he told me that for a while he was actually number two in the world on that game. Like he played online and he was that good to the point where he, at one point in time, <laughs> he had the number two ranking. That's gnarly. That's pretty fucking epic. I had a friend that was um, number two in the world on Red Dead Redemption. Coincidentally, he was also number Holy two. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And dude, he did literally did nothing but like sit on his couch and play Red Dead while his wife like went to work and oh, he would shit. just bring in the money. I know that name. What era is that game? Like what year approximately would that game have been a thing? Uh, maybe like Which one? Eight, Red Dead? Eight years ago. Yeah, Red Dead, maybe like eight years ago. Okay, so it's it's semi recent. Two thousand twelve, maybe or something. I don't know. Yeah. I see. I think I remember the hype, everyone playing that and like you could you could do like a lot of uh, like get a custom horse and get custom cowboy clothes and shit, right? Yeah. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about a PC game. There's a few PC games that I played a lot. Maybe next time I'll go into more. But there was one specific game that I played. Jonathan, you might remember this one. I think you recommended it. It's called Redneck Rampage. <laughs> yeah, dude, I had that game for PC also. <laughs> okay, it was you that recommended yeah. that one. And and that game sucked, man. Like, <laughs> it was so hard. Like, kids' games for PC back when we were kids were so hard either it was stupid shit like math blaster or something <laughs> like that like we played at school you know yeah or carmen san diego yeah where in the world's carmen san diego or it was something like this that was like under the the guise of a really cool look, fun looking game was so hard to play it was gimmicky so that game was a first person shooter it was doom ish except you're a redneck <laughs> and i think the plot is like aliens come to your farm and they ain't taking your land. This is America and I got a shotgun kind of thing. Absolutely. Was it based in Indiana? <laughs> I think it was a little more south. Yeah, this was, this was like a, an Less Oklahoma. Teeth. <laughs> Less teeth. We're the middle finger of the south, they say. It was a very like flatulent game. Like there's a lot of like fart noises in it and stuff and like gross kind of humor i'm pretty sure they were drunk like you had to get drunk to like withstand the alien like attacks and stuff like that like the moonshine increases yeah. your health i'm pretty right. sure this right. looks just like doom it, it, it kind of is and i remember my dad had like a little like freak out moment when he heard about me playing this game because he, his problem with it was that you drink the alcohol and that cures you and he's like i don't want you playing a game where you know, alcohol is going to make you better in the game or like be any kind of like positive influence on your character. And I was like, Dad, 
come on, what's the worst that can happen? It's not like it's going to affect me later. <laughs> See, we got to talk about our dads, man. I think that's the one that, like... It, you still got drunk though, and so you had to go for like the middle of the three that you were looking at. Like, yeah, there actually... was like a drunk bar. Yeah, yeah, if you if you cross the threshold, right, you would lose control. Like forward would move you backward, kind of thing. Right. Oh my right. god! So drinking got you better for some time, and then when you drank too much, it was. Yeah, then it was it bad. Was, it was counter-effective. I yeah. think that actually helped my argument with him because I never got taken away. The game was just so bad that I stopped playing. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I ever got out of the first level. Like, no, me neither. Or something like I that. would just shoot chickens for fun and like yeah. just left it at that. I mean, we've gone through most of the consoles. I, we're, we're getting close to wrapping up. I just want to quickly talk about maybe anything we missed and some arcade games as well. Now, there was a very famous arcade game, still kind of famous, but especially in the 90s, this game was big, and that was the Simpsons Arcade. Right, Brother Josh? Oh, my gosh. I love the Simpsons Arcade game. It was always just so cool to see the family working together to kick some ass. You were, like, into The Simpsons, it sounds like? Not really even that much, honestly. And to this day, I'm still really not. But for some reason, that beat em up sort of side-scroller, a lot like uh, Turtles in Time, right, Stevie? Wouldn't you say? Have you ever seen The Simpsons? Oh, yeah. You're talking about, like, The Simpsons, like, arcade, like, side-scroller games? Yeah, except, like, Bart had a skateboard he could beat him up with. Homer had a bowling ball he could, like, beat their well, ass he ma- with. He mainly used his fists. He was, like, boxing most of the time. <laughs> most of the time. But you could get a bowling ball. Oh, if we're talking about Simpsons games, there was a Simpsons game called Simpsons Hit and Run that totally got sued and uh, lost a copyright lawsuit against... Uh, Crazy Taxi. Uh, Crazy Taxi, That's a really good yes. game. Oh, that game is, like, very fondly remembered by... Uh, people our age. I hear people mention that every now and then. Hit and Run was a great game. Simpsons also had an they had an NES game that was like really hard, but I remember playing that really vaguely. They had an open world game on the PC for a while. Did you guys remember that oh game? Oh my god, you played that open world game? Where yeah. you could like go into Mr. Burns' office and unlock the secret door and shit yeah. like that? Yeah, and there's like pictures on a bulletin board or some shit. Oh, that's just really vague. <laughs> what the hell was that That one game? was like a kind of like a point and click game, Josh, if I remember yes. correctly. Like you would just like go and interact with people. I don't remember there yep. being much of a plot. Yeah. I always felt like there'd be something like kind of naughty behind the next door. I feel like that's why I liked it back then. <laughs> that's what Josh was waiting for. Yeah, I mean, there kind of was. There'd be like a guy with his pants down, and then you see his underwear or whatever. There was that little shit like that. Yeah, but going back to the Simpsons arcade game, Paul Schaefer and I, Stevie, one time drove all the way out to the South Bend airport because we heard they had that game, and they did, and we beat it. And what? that was... Yeah, dude. I don't know if they still have it to this day. Like, super doubtful. doubtful. But super yeah. doubtful. Like, South Bay and Airport, you guys, like, there's three arcade games at the very far end and, like, three places for an airplane to, like, pull in to get people. It's the smallest airport. Corey, you'll see it someday soon. Corey, did you ever go to the Boys and Girls Club in Wainimi? Oh, hell yeah. It was right so, next to my school. Oh, okay. So... That was like my first experience with arcade games, and they had the most fondest memories of, of games for me, which was the Simpsons game, Street Fighter, yes. and WWF Superstars, which had like <laughs> the old like Hacksaw Jim Duggan and Big Boss Man, yes. Ultimate Warrior, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> all those classic names in WWE. <laughs> right. And it was cool because you could like clean up around the boys and girls club and stuff in exchange for tokens for the for the arcade games oh i never knew that yeah i would do that well, have, you could bring paid. your own quarters or or you could clean up and earn credits with them and so that's how i got to play games man i i had so many fun times there playing pool yep. getting annihilated in pool because i didn't know how to play yeah <laughs> uh, me and shane used to spend a lot of afternoons there after school Right, it's right up there by the bike path, man. That right. 
I played Mortal Kombat there, and that's how I knew that there was a actual gory version of Mortal Kombat, as opposed to the <laughs> shitty Super Nintendo one I had. I've been lied to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's how I got introduced into Street Fighter, man. That was uh, good times, man. Being E Honda over there trying to do the little knife judo chop on the uh, on the car, you know, yeah. busting up the car. You know, Corey, awesome. it's, it's funny you bring up arcades. I, more th- I think my dad wanted me to be a professional gamer. I really do. <laughs> that was his goal for you before that was even a thing? Well, it's weird because I remember... <sighs> Josh, you know the UP Mall, right? I used to be a big like video game arcade out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember when I was like nine or ten, my dad took me out there because he wanted to go to the arcade. And you guys remember Soul Calibur, the fighting game? Yes. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. I remember holding court on like eight straight people in Soul Calibur. And my dad <laughs> just like watching me and like patting me on the back every time I won. It's not like I was like fighting children. I was like fighting like people in like their late teens and early twenties and just beating the living shit out of them. He's running side bets. <laughs> and I just remember my dad being like, Good job. Like, good job. Like, I'll do this. Oh, good job. And when I think about Step on up, see if you can beat my kid. Yeah. <laughs> he he wasn't congratulating you, Stevie. He was trying to like tap you on the shoulder to get his own place in line just to shit on you. Like, he was like waiting to ruin you after you beat like nine people. I just remember that. That's funny. Yeah. I remember being really proud of that day, man. Like, man, I'd be like nine or ten people. That's awesome. And then, yeah, I think my dad just wanted me to be a gamer. Hmm. Review, dude, I'm going to go to you in a second, but that just, for some reason, it reminded me of a of a quick story I remember. When I was like 13, my family took a family trip to Vegas, and it was a lot of fun just doing like family activities. Obviously, <clears throat> me and my brothers are all young children, so we're not doing the adult Vegas stuff, but there was a lot to do for us. One of the things that me and one of my brothers did, we went to an arcade, his name's Robert, and we were given like 20 bucks or whatever, we're playing a bunch of games. But he goes to one arcade game. I think it was one of the Tekken games. And he didn't have to put in a quarter. Someone like put in a quarter and left. So he just got to pick it up and start playing. So that was kind of cool. But then whatever character he was already assigned, he played as. And he beat the whole game through (laughs) without having to put in any quarters. So he went to this arcade cabinet, didn't have to put in money, beat the whole game without having to put in any extra quarters. And I remember as a kid being like, He's like the wizard. Like he, it's like, he's a gaming savant. Like there's something magical about. I could not believe that he did that. Like it blew my fucking mind. But yeah, I don't even know if Robert remembers that story. If he's listening, <laughs> let us know in the comments. But man, I remember just I was so in awe of him at that moment in time. That's still pretty cool, Corey. To this it day, is. that's dope. On a side note, with speaking of Vegas and video games, did you ever go to the GameWorks? place in vegas it was like right next to coca-cola nope oh man it's closed now but like that was like the most amazing place to go in the 90s if you were a kid our age (sighs) i missed out it was like an epic arcade or what epic dude like google it one day and you can look at at game works i think they might exist somewhere still like in ontario or something like that but they has to have a sick one right there i don't need any more boulevard disappointments to add to my childhood jonathan <laughs> and one thing i wanted this is not related to video games but the thing i wanted like more than anything was to go to nickelodeon studios at universal studios in orlando florida like i wanted to go there so fucking bad and to this day i get depressed thinking about that i did not get to go there yeah it doesn't exist anymore. i just wanted to go see like yeah. what would you do be filmed live and get a pie oh in my, my face God, or something dude me too. I wanted to <laughs> wild. Why couldn't I be a wild and crazy kid? God damn it! It's wild and crazy. <laughs> crazy. That's it. When when big dumb movie and spoilers and review dude all have like a retreat somewhere one day. We're gonna do this. We're gonna recreate the slime and pie in your face. All I want to know is who gets to be Mark Summers. <laughs> yeah. Mark Summers was so cool. Anyway, sorry. Review, dude. Are there any arcade games that you liked or any that we missed that you wanted to talk about kind of before we wrap up here? There was a a niche little arcade game called Metal Slug. I played uh, Metal Slug 3 quite a bit. Uh, I don't remember 
where, but I have that memory, and it, it's something I downloaded on the the Xbox 360 years later. So I've played it since then. I still play it to this day, and it's a fucking fantastic game. I still play Metal Slug anytime I see it in an arcade. Like that is not a niche oh, little so f- game, dude. Yeah, like, that-, that is a fucking like arcade staple right there. That is a legendary game. To getting two people and just like gunning through everything you see. Unlimited ammo. Yes. It's amazing. Well, I am from Alabama, so every time I'm like, hey, you ever heard this <laughs> game called Metal Slug? So people are like, what the fuck is a video get out. game? Get out. They're like, get the fuck off my property, boy. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like Sunset Riders, kind of. We don't take oh. kindly to your video game types. <laughs> Dude, Sunset Riders is equally as epic. That was a classic game. Josh, let me guess. You were Billy when you played. Steve. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Billy had the double guns. I was all about the Billy. I like the shotguns. Uh, Stevie, do you have any before we wrap up? Oh, man. No, I think I pretty much touched on um, how my dad tried to mentally break me down with Tekken, but I overcame it. So, yeah, I think I'm good. <laughs> I know Jonathan's got something on his mind. Yeah, I just got one last thing. I just want to give a quick shout-out to the Nintendo Wii uh, console. So many people had it, but it sucked. It was so bad. <laughs> but it was, like, it's... But it was still fun, though, you know? Like, the stupid tennis game and the bowling game, like, it, it was still a good time. People that did not play video games had that fucking bowling shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and the and the people that had no business playing video games in the first place were the people that ruined you in bowling, <laughs> playing Wii. Yeah. Like, they were so good for some reason. Yeah, so I don't know. I've never played this game before. <laughs> Hustling yeah. you like it's a like they're a pool shark. It's my first time. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, if you think about it, that bowling game's got to be like top ten video games of all time. I'm not even joking. I mean, even as simple and and you know low graphics, and it's never been changed or gotten any better. Like it's still a game that people play today. Like even and my wife's family, the kids turn on the Wii every time we have like a big party or you know Christmas, Thanksgiving, or whatever. I can still feel like the ball in my like with that feel with that controller. That's just like the perfect game for that system. You know, and they had, those controllers had the steering wheel add-on for Mario Kart, and that made Mario Kart like a lot of fun in in a steering wheel mode rather than a controller mode. I see where you're coming from. I yeah. do think Wii was a little bit gimmicky, and that some of the games weren't always very responsive. For sure, it had its issues. There was a boxing game that I think like came with like the bowling, and I think there was like a package of a few games. Right, it was like Wii Sports or something yeah. like that. Is what it came <laughs> yeah. with. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> So I play. I was like, okay, I'm gonna pick up this boxing game. This should be fun. It's 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 responsive to my movements, right? So I'm at a friend's house who has an eight year old kid, right? So I'm like, I'm gonna go against this eight year old kid, and I'm like, I'm probably gonna just dominate this kid, you know? Because right. I'm like, I'm gonna stick and move. Like I'm, I know when to block and stuff. I've been in a fight. I know what to do. And like, I've been in a fight. <laughs> <laughs> this kid is just holding controllers, just jumping up and down, spinning around, just like flailing their arms around and like just fucking beat the fucking brakes off me, dude. Like just beat the living shit out of me. It was like Mike Tyson, just like Corey, Corey's like, dude, this kid fucks. <laughs> this kid fucks. <laughs> dude, that kid can fight. No, but for real though, I, it just, I just want to say that the controls were not responsive like you could just flail around and win i mean that's bullshit oh for sure i mean there was a little bit of like control and and rhythm you had to have for the bowling game stuff like that but uh or for tennis but like the boxing was total bullshit and you had like you had to hold the other half of the controller in your other hand and you only had like 18 inches of lead between the two like that shit sucked the boxing was awful you know what the uh, the Wii controller did? It brought back the Z button at the back of the fucking <laughs> controller. <laughs> Another yeah. reason to be angry with it, yeah. You know how many? I I think it was like a like a conspiracy. The Wii with all the TV manufacturers, like oh all my the kids God. that launched those controllers into their flat screens. 
<laughs> yeah, flat screens and Wii were coming out around the same time. <laughs> right. Late, later plasmas. <laughs> Pieces of shit. Yep. And then they started getting into LCD, LED. Yeah, many TVs were destroyed because of Wii consoles. Um, I think that's about all the games we're going to get into here. I have had a lot of fun discussing nostalgic video games and video game memories with you guys. I hope we can do a part two down the line. I think that would be really fun. We can go in more into GameCube and some maybe some of the other obscure consoles. Talk about uh, Sega Genesis 32X and the <laughs> failure of that unit. Jaguar? <laughs> Atari Jaguar. Perfect. Josh, before we go, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about your podcast, the one that you run, and where they can find it? Well, I can't take very much credit for Spoilers Podcast, but <laughs> me, Stevie, I know, I'm just me, Stevie, Pappy, who you've probably heard on this podcast, and actually, Corey, you're on it as a regular persona. You're a spoiler man. So we have another podcast called Spoilers Podcast, and we kind of have this movie game where every episode we have a trivia. Whoever wins the trivia chooses the next game. Stevie, what's like a recent movie we're doing? What's like our style? I, like, how would you describe it? Um, what we just got done doing? We did a Captain Ron. Before that, we did a bunch of scary Oof. movies. Then we were doing the raids. The Boondock Saints. What's Corey's style on spoilers? He's like, it's Pat. He tries to like sink spoilers, I think is actually. It's Pat. Uh, Clifford was a great pick. <laughs> He's a fucking sabotage. <laughs> uh, the Angry Inch, what was that? Um, oh, Hedwig? Hed- that Hedwig. was a great one. Hedwig was a great one. The Snowman. Great movie. You pick Snowman? Dude, yeah. what's your problem, you fucking man? asshole. <laughs> I thought Mikey picked that for some odd reason. Hey, dude. Corey fucks, all right? <laughs> Corey fucks. <laughs> well, I think that describes spoilers the best possible way. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Review dude, Josh, where can people find you, and what do you do, sir? Uh, well... I do not fuck at my channel. Uh, you can type review ink or review D double O D. And I just, I make fun of movies. Very good. Thank you, Jonathan, for being here. Thank you, Stevie and the two Joshes. High guy, Josh and low guy, Josh are both here today. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all for listening. I would like to do more content like this. So let us know if you thought it was fun. Uh, if you want to, Support this podcast, leave a positive rating and written review on Apple Podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, even if you don't listen on YouTube. Give our YouTube videos a thumbs up, again, even if you don't listen there. And uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much for listening. We love you, and good night. Big dumb movie fucks. (laughs) 